Um, but why don't we get started? So um, again, I, I wanted to, to welcome everybody here. This is our Advances in Urologic Oncology, which is a, a CME course uh, that's available for all folks to attend. It's also part of our Grand Round series at Northwestern and, and obviously resident education. Today, we're really, really fortunate to have Dr. Sh Joel Scheinfeld from Memorial Sloan Kettering talking about testis cancer today. I mean, Dr. Scheinfeld uh, did his medical school at the University of Florida, residency at the University of Rochester, and then fellowship at Sloan Kettering, and then stayed on and, and really has just built just an amazing testis cancer program that really has shaped how, how we treat testis cancer, right? When I was thinking back about all of our fellows and residents who attended, right? So it's, you know, Scott, Tom Jang, Shom, myself, Rich, Greg, all of us. I mean, he's just taken, you know, really kind of taken us under his wing as, as a special kind of care at Memorial. And, and interestingly, all of us have done testis. Um, and I think that's because of it. I mean, as I said, the, the trip, the fellowship is hard but the trip is worth it to, to work with Dr. Scheinfeld. You, you will not see anything like that. What you see 50 some testis patients in, in a half day in clinic. I mean, it's, it's, you'll, you'll never have that opportunity or else. And so we're really in for a treat today. So thank you so much for giving us a lecture. We, we can't wait to hear from you. Well, thanks very much for the invitation and the very kind words, uh, Josh. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to share our experience in testis with you. As you went through the list of Northwestern alumni, there was one, uh, McGuire, uh, Mike was there before the group you mentioned. And uh, I remember Tony, Dr. Schaefer asked me if Northwestern could be on the family plan. That's when you and Scott and, uh, and Shom were here. Nevertheless, it's a privilege here. And um, again, I thought I'd uh, talk about optimizing retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, anatomic and technical considerations. I have uh, no conflicts of interest. interest. Um, and RPLND. RPLND remains a critical component in the management of selected patients with both low stage and advanced disease. Uh, both for non seminoma and seminoma and i apologize for that that's one of the this again apologies one of the things doing it from home uh so and it's uh relevant for non-seminoma and increasingly for seminoma as well rplnd is both a staging and a therapeutic procedure but it always has to be done with therapeutic <laughs> intent um Suboptimal RPLND results in suboptimal outcomes and in germ cell the potential consequences of untreated uh, retroperitoneal metastasis include reoperative surgery, relapse, late relapse, somatic transformation of teratoma, and inferior outcomes. So in any surgery, there's a fundamental relationship between anatomy and the surgery. Uh, that's true in the retroperitoneum. It's true for any case. It's true for open or minimally invasive surgery. You have to know your anatomy cold. Uh, and an in-depth understanding of anatomy is absolutely critical to surgical planning, optimizing exposure, minimizing adverse events, and optimizing outcomes. So today we'll focus obviously on retroperitoneal anatomy with particular emphasis on neurovascular anatomy um, and describe RPLND and the potential consequences of suboptimal surgery. I'm gonna start off with complications, which is usually left for the end and minimized. And you're all familiar with acute events and long-term events of RPLND vascular problems, pancreatic injuries, bowel issues, ascites, uh, and lymphatic uh, leakage, and long-term retrograde ejaculation. And those in red, I've highlighted, because as I describe the surgery, I'll focus on these and hopefully how to avoid these. 
So again, to emphasize, you cannot go into any surgery without knowledge of the anatomy. And in many of these cases, you have large masses, the anatomy is distorted, structures aren't where they should be. So you need to know where they should be. You need to find the structures before they find you. Um, you need good exposure. You have to set up the RPLMD so you're able to handle any problems that could come up. And then split and roll technique, plus or minus adjunctive procedures, most commonly a nephrectomy. And in any surgery, um, you want to do the easy parts first, and that makes the harder parts easier. Every step in a surgery should make subsequent steps easier and safer. If that's not happening, there's a fundamental problem in your approach to that case. Every case, every step will make everything subsequent to that step easier and safer. If that's not happening, you really have to regroup. So um, there are a number of anomalies in the retroperitoneum, and you have to be uh, aware of them uh, because they pop up not infrequently, particularly vascular anomalies, left-sided cavas, retroaortic renal veins, gonadal veins draining into aberrant sites, um, horseshoe kidney, pelvic kidney, so forth. So you have to know these things going <laughs> This is an example of a left-sided vena cava, a coronal view, axial view. This is a duplicated vena cava, right side, left-sided cava. This is a duplicated ureter. This is a pelvic kidney. This is a horseshoe kidney with vessels coming in all sorts of directions. This is what it looks like. Um, now, in my opinion, <clears throat> The most important landmark in the retroperitoneum is the left renal vein. And this is where it normally should look like. Um, you should not be able to see the base of the SMA, the su superior mesenteric artery. This is the aorta, and the left renal vein will course anterior to the aorta. Now, when you see the base of the SMA so cleanly, like you do here in the circle to, to the right, here where I have the pointer, um, that indicates that that left renal vein is somewhere else, and it's usually behind the aorta. And that changes everything. You need to be aware it can be confused with a lumbar vein um, and tied off. It also, if you're looking for the left renal vein, which is the first landmark you look for once you've eviscerated the bowel, and you're looking for it and you're dissecting in a northward direction, in a cephalic direction, going up, 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 you'll end up barging into either the pancreas or the SMA and running into all sorts of problems. So you have to know ahead of time that that's what you're dealing with. And this is what it looks like in the axial view. And this is what it looks like in a coronal view. And here you see a mass sitting right on top of it in the interior cable space. So, um, Again, just to emphasize, these anatomic relationships are fundamental in terms of avoiding trouble. Left renal vein with the SMA taking off right above it. Circumaortic renal vein, there's an anterior limb in the normal uh, position, but then there's also a retroaortic renal uh, component, and it's okay uh, to then tie that off if it's not a, a, a dominant limb, but at least this anterior limb gives you the landmark and tells you where the SMA is, where you need to stop, where you're going to hit the head of the pancreas, and so forth. And this is what it looks like. Here's the posterior limb. Here's the anterior limb. Here's the dissected aorta. Multiple renal arteries, you see that about a quarter of the cases. Uh, there are multiple approaches. Midline is by far the most common. And again, I'm not going to get into um, minimally invasive approaches. Uh, um, have not needed to do a thoracal abdominal in more than 20 years. For bulky, superhylar masses, a chevron 
uh, will do the trick. So you need to expose the retroperitoneum. Exposure is good exposure is your friend to avoid uh, avoid problems or being able to fix problems. You want to divide the falciform ligament that takes uh, tension off the capsule of the liver and you don't tear the capsule. You put in your retractors, you um, place the transverse colon and omentum up on the chest. And this is what that looks like. Here's a netter graphic. Here is what it looks like. You put the transverse colon and the omentum up on wet laps. And then to approach the retroperitoneum, you wanna incise the posterior parietal peritoneum. And the two key landmarks are, one, you wanna stay medial to the inferior mesenteric vein. Um, and you wanna stay lateral to the right gonadal vein. The right gonadal vein has to drop down. If you're medial to it, it will stay up with the right colon. So you wanna be lateral, drop that uh, right gonadal vein down. So you go down to, around the cecum and up the right gutter, cocorize the duodenum, and then you wanna protect the duodenum, pancreas, and the SMA when you place your retractors. So here's the inferior mesenteric vein, and you can sacrifice that if you have bulky disease and need to release the tail of the pancreas even more. So the incision in the posterior parietal peritoneum is just medial to the IMV. You come down to the cecum and up along the gutter. And again, as you come down here, the right gonadal vein drops down. And this is what that looks like. And here, um, here is the bowel totally eviscerated. You see your left renal vein here, the SMA here, pancreas, duodenum. And you can put it in a bowel bag. We use uh, moist uh, laps. And just a quick caution here for lengthy, complicated procedures that take hours and hours. This bowel can become very edematous and very heavy. And you wanna keep checking it periodically and make sure that there's no vascular compromise, one. And two, as it gets heavier and heavier, remember it's just hanging on the root of the mesentery, it's hanging on the SMA. And um, you don't wanna see the weight of the bowel avulse that SMA. That is something you absolutely never ever wanna see. So uh, something to keep in mind. So the bowel has been exteriorized, then you're looking for your left renal vein. And SMA is gonna be up here, the pancreas is up on the chest, the duodenum is up on the chest, the IMV is here. And again, this can be sacrificed if you have bulky disease in this area. So here we are, we're starting to find the left renal vein. And so you wanna just connect it from the cava all the way out here. You wanna clip all these lymphatics. And then there is a, an avascular plane between the inferior mesenteric vein, which is a peritoneal structure, and the left gonadal, which is a retroperitoneal structure. And if you go down parallel between these two, you'll develop a thick lymphatic band and you wanna ligate and divide that band and that will release the distal pancreas, expose the distal left renal vein and the periortic space. Okay, and again, to emphasize if you have issues releasing the tail of the pancreas or things are very tight here, you can sacrifice the IMV without a problem. So here is that thick band that develops when you dissect parallel to the inferior mesenteric vein and the gonadal. Here's this thick band, you divide it, and again, releases the distal pancreas, exposes the distal left renal vein. It's also a site, if you don't control this, it's a site of major lymphatic leaks. And there are really three areas 
uh, of significant lymphatic leaks. That band that I just spoke about, the lymphatics that drain around the area of the SMA, ar around the renal vessels, and then behind the right renal artery, branches of the cisterna. And if you have significant leaks, this is what you end up with here, uh, bottles of uh, chylosocytes. And risk factors for uh, chylosocytes, suprahyalar dissections, cable resections, and hepatic resections. So again, these are areas you want to be meticulous in terms of clipping and tying off lymphatics and so forth. Then you're ready to put in your retractors. And again, you want to be very careful because uh, you want to place the retractors on either side of the SMA. You do not want to put a retractor at the base of the SMA and injure the SMA. Injuries to the SMA are usually lethal. Not always, but that's a problem you, you never want to see. And this is what it looks like. Here's the retractor on the left. On the right, the duodenum is behind there. The tail of the pancreas is behind this. And again, if you've mobilized things properly and released the, the, uh, the tissues, there should be no traction because if there's uh, traction, you end up with a pancreatic injury. And the SMA, again, is above the renal vein and it's between your retractors. Too much traction, and this is what you end up with, a pancreatic injury, very high on the list of things you never wanna see. These patients get very sick very quickly. So you've placed your retractors, you've mobilized everything, you've exteriorized the bowel, you're ready to go. And then you want to just subtract the great vessels, the vena cava and the aorta from lymph nodes, masses, a combination thereof. And here are the lumbar vessels, lumbar arteries, lumbar veins, and you divide those. And we'll get into the lumbar, uh, the, the neurovascular anatomy in more detail in a few minutes. So you're ready to go, and I want to just stress that uh, the optimal operation, in my view, is a bilateral RPLND. And again, historically, a bilateral RPLND without nerve sparing, like this, uh, ends up with retrograde ejaculation. And the retrograde ejaculation was the impetus to modify templates to avoid the nerves on the contralateral side and thus preserve ejaculation. And so modified templates sprung up all over the place, including memorial. And here are example of a few right-sided templates. You can see uh, the surgical perimeter is highly variable. And these are a few left-sided templates, again, with variable perimeters of resection. And so this is a very commonly used uh, modified template, uh, the Weisbach template. And again, the concept is to avoid surgery in areas that are thought to be at low risk from met metastatic disease. And how is this risk of metastatic disease determined? And it was based on multiple mapping studies, the best one, which was Dr. Donahue uh, back in 82, where he mapped out for right-sided primaries and left-sided primaries, uh, node by node, and he would put them on a, um, during the surgery, he had a template right by, uh, right by, uh, right in the room, and meticulously um, mapped out every node. Again, this is um, early 80s and late 70s. So again, many cases that were done wouldn't be done today with the kind of sophisticated imaging we have. Nevertheless, this is a superb study and laid the groundwork uh, for primary landing zones and, uh, and our knowledge of common metastatic pathways. Weisbach did the same thing a few years later. 
again, each dot representing a uh, metastatic uh, lymph node for left-sided uh, primary tumors and down below for right-sided. And the problem with mapping studies, all mapping studies, is that they always underestimate retroperitoneal disease, always. You cannot assess the incidence of unresected retroperitoneal disease without follow-up. You don't know how many dots would appear in a month, six months, a year. And two of the studies had no follow-up and one had very limited follow-up. So that's a significant shortcoming with that approach. And the second problem is you cannot assess how many of dots would have appeared if uh, if chemotherapy had not been administered postoperatively. Because adjuvant chemotherapy, and this is the most effective chemotherapy for solid tumors, uh, will prevent many relapses. So again, mapping studies underestimate disease for these two reasons primarily. So we looked at a number of templates, modified templates, and Scott Egner and Brett Carver did this. Scott Egner, one of your alumni, and looked at a number of templates, including our own. Uh, and you can see that the check mark includes areas included in the template and for right-sided and left-sided. And Scott's paper was for primary uh, RPLMDs. We had already done uh, uh, converted to bilateral. So this is 500 consecutive bilateral RPLMDs in, primary, uh, in the primary setting. And you can see, depending on the perimeter of the surgery, that you're going to leave a lot of extra template disease unresected. Excuse me, sir. And that's highly variable, again, depending on the perimeter of the template for right-sided and left-sided, ranging anywhere from 4 to 25%. The histology of the extra template unresected disease is essentially the same as that inside the template. So this is primary node dissections, a lot of disease uh, left on the table. Same study done in the post-chemo setting, 532 RPLNDs, um, and Brett Carver, and again, Scott Egner was involved in this study. And again, depending on the perimeter of the template, you're leaving a lot of unresected disease behind. This is Indiana data. Again, this is a reoperative series, and they identified the sites of reoperative surgery where the uh, unresected disease was, and again, outside of a template in the contralateral site for both left and right side. There tends to be more right to left crossover than left to right. So right-sided extra template is always going to be higher. This is European data. Again, same theme. A lot of unresected disease if you restrict your surgical template. Now, the studies also showed that there's a small subset of patients that have disease only on the contralateral side. The ipsilateral side is negative. All the disease is on the contralateral side. And that ranges anywhere from 3 to 5%. So the theme very clearly is there is um, disease outside of modified templates. So it's, in my view, a suboptimal approach. Um, looking at lymph node uh, counts, and this was uh, done by uh, Houston Thompson when he was a fellow before he went back to Mayo. And he, was lo he looked at no total node count and number of positive lymph nodes. And what you see is the more lymph nodes you resect, the higher the 
possibility, the probability of finding positive lymph nodes, i.e. the more you look, the more you find, and the data dichotomizes at about 40 lymph nodes. So if you have 40 or more lymph nodes, you essentially double the probability of finding positive nodes. Um, so again, ipsilateral disease predicts for contralateral disease, much more so for right-sided primaries than for left side, but nevertheless, um, there is a significant subset of patients that are going to have unresected disease if you do not address the contralateral side, i.e. if you don't do a bilateral template. And if you're there, you need to get the, the biggest bang for your buck. And if you're avoiding the contralateral side, it's because radiographically there's nothing there and it should not add a great deal of time. I mean, uh, that's not where the real morbidity is. This is data from Toronto. Rob Hamilton uh, was a fellow with us. And when he went back to uh, Toronto, uh, took over the testis program from Mike Jewett. And he showed that increased node count is associated with decreased risk of relapse. So again, the higher the node count, the better the results in his uh, series. Node count, uh, Brett Carver looked at node count in the post-chemo setting, excluding patients who had viable disease. This is looking only at teratoma and fibrosis. And you can see that the risk of uh, the relapse-free probability increases as the node count goes up. That's true for small, intermediate, and large masses. The more nodes, the better patients do. Fewer relapses, better outcomes. So it all goes down, the better the operation, the better the outcomes. And this is what happens Here's your bilateral template, and here's your modified template that doesn't address the contralateral side. It leaves it vulnerable. And it leaves it vulnerable to what? To relapses, late relapses, reoperative surgery, and inferior outcomes. And the data is pretty compelling. If you look at reoperative surgery, three out of four are going to be in the periodic space. Um, that's true for primary node dissections. It's true for post-chemo dissections. If you're going to have retroperitoneal recurrences, the vast majority are going to be in the periodic space. And why is that? Well, first, most modified templates don't include the periodic space. So surgeons are never there. So that's first reason. And the second reason is technically, this is an area that is more demanding. It takes more work to mobilize the pancreas, expose the renal vein, dissect and skeletonize the renal vessels. So it's technically more demanding and, uh, and surgeons often uh, are a bit more reluctant to be aggressive in this area. So again, we were part of the modified club for, for years and we stopped doing modified templates end of 98. And what happened? Well, you can see the risk of relapse dropped substantially pre and post 98, 99. You can see the risk of relapse dropped way down. Now, that's multifactorial. There's better patient selection. Uh, we excluded patients with elevated markers. We do chest scans of the chest. So you have better patients, but better surgery. And that was an independent variable. So better patients, better surgery, better surgery, better results. In the post-chemo setting, same thing. Um, you can see that, that the risk of relapse drops as the years go by, uh, and 
again, there are many uh, variables here. You have better patients. Uh, there's been stage migration. The masses are a bit smaller. Uh, the treatments are a bit more effective. But the most important uh, variable was a complete no dissection. So complete no, better patients, better surgery, better results in the post-chemo setting as well as the primary setting. So how to address the issue of retrograde ejaculation? And the answer is nerve sparing techniques. You identify, dissect, preserve the nerves that are responsible for anti-grade ejaculation. And that obviates the need to reduce your templates to preserve anti-grade ejaculation. And it reduces the risk of understaging and undertreating the retroperitoneum. And the nerves you need to preserve are both sympathetic chains, the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, and the hypogastric plexus. And here they are in real life. And to do nerve sparing, you really have to uh, know the neurovascular anatomy so that you know where to look for these nerves and how to protect them and preserve them. Excuse me. And this is very elegant anatomic cadaveric studies done by Nick Power uh, when he returned after his fellowship to London, Ontario with Tyler Beveridge. Uh, and they did some very, very elegant studies. And uh, let's just address lumbar vessels here. Lumbar arteries between the renal vessels and the bifurcation of the uh, aorta and cava, lumbar arteries are usually paired and they're usually going to find um, three, sometimes four, lateral and medial. Veins are not paired, and veins more commonly bifurcate and trifurcate. And those branches are the ones that can get you into trouble. So here we are, just more detail on the neurovascular anatomy. Lumbar vessel, sympathetic trunk, and the postganglionic sympathetic nerves. So here's your cava. Here are lumbar veins. You can see they, they bifurcate. The upper lumbar tends to aim northward. The lower ones sometimes are an angle south. Here is the right sympathetic uh, trunk, the left sympathetic trunk, and the branches that uh, take off from the ganglia. And here they are superimposed. So here's the right sympathetic trunk behind the vena cava. Here is the left one lateral to the aorta. You can see here the lumbar vessels that are inserting medial to the trunks. And so the nerves on the right side come underneath the cava, anterior to the aorta, and they come on down and congregate hypogastric plexus. So the paracaval space here, there are no nerves to worry about here. Here's your right gonadal vein. The nerves are all underneath the cava and medial. Lateral to the trunk, lateral to the cava, there are no nerves to worry about. And so you can roll the cava medially, tie off lumbar veins, find the nerves uh, underneath the cava, or you can find the nerves between the cava and the aorta. So here's the trunk on the right side. We've divided the lumbar veins, and you can see that the lumbar veins are inserting just medial to the trunk. And so you can find the nerves here, lateral to the cava, underneath the cava, and this is what it looks like in real life. Here is the cava lifted up. Here is the sympathetic trunk. Here's ganglia. Here's the nerve taking off. And you can see the vessels, the lumbar artery and vein, inserting just inside the sympathetic trunk. And you need to know this uh, rela anatomic relationship because sometimes these vessels can get away from you. You lose them. They retract. And before you throw in big stitches or start, start boving at 100, 
um, you can just find them. Uh, if you know where to look for them, pick them up and then control them without damaging the nerves. So this is the anatomic relationships that are relevant and germane to pre preservation of the nerves and anti-grade ejaculation. So you can loop these nerves either underneath the cava or anterior in the interior cable space here, and you just trace them out from the trunk to the hypogastric plexus. You control the hypogastric plexus, and then you uh, preserve these nerves. Um, and you can see here an example of lumbar veins that are bifurcating. So um, again, when you do your split and roll, you always want to split first along the cava, because if you split along the aorta first, you're going to injure all these nerves. So you must find the nerves first, dissect them, loop them, get them out of the way, then you can do your split on the aorta. And again, just a reminder, it's great to preserve the nerves, but you don't ever do that at the expense of optimal oncologic outcome. So this is what it looks like in the interior cable space. Um, and again, um, you trace them out. The hypogastric plexus is going to pretty much uh, aggregate in the area of the inferior mesenteric artery, which is why that's a key landmark as well. So again, you split first on the cava, isolate, preserve the nerves, and then you can split along the aorta. What about the paraaortic dissection on the left side? And you want to be very cognizant of the descending lumbar vein, which comes off the uh, left renal vein, because that's a vessel that can get you into a lot of trouble very quickly. This is the area that I showed you before that is uh, has the highest potential for infield recurrences. So here we are in the periodic space. Here is that descending lumbar coming off uh, the uh, left renal vein. Again, left renal vein, the SMA here. Again, just to remind you over and over. And here's your left gonadal. And again, just a reminder uh, about that descending lumbar vein because it's easy to uh, get into it and then you've got uh, a lot of bleeding going on. You know, your, your, uh, your vision is impaired and that's, you can injure the renal artery underneath there uh, and have all sorts of problems. So just knowing that it's there, you look for it, you find it, you control it, and that opens up that space. So here's your left sympathetic trunk, the nerves coming off, you can, loop them, dissect them, and then follow them down. And again, you can see how all these nerves sort of find their way to the IMA. And this is what it looks like in real life. Here is the cava. Here is the, sympath here is the uh, hypogastric plexus. You can see it here with these white vessel loops. So here's the cava, left renal vein, aorta, left renal artery, here's your sympathetic trunk. Here are the lumbar arteries that have not yet been divided. And here's your anterior spinous ligament. And again, these notice how these lumbar vessels insert just inside the trunk, the sympathetic trunk. So again, it's these nerves really do exist. You have to know where to look for them, find them. Take your time, it adds time to the procedure. But when you do that, you preserve ejaculation, you don't have to limit the perimeter of your surgery. And in the primary setting, you should be able to preserve anti-grade ejaculation greater than 95% of the time. Then the post-chemo setting, uh, for small masses, uh, it's over 80, 85%. And even in larger masses, we're able to preserve it at least half the time. 
Now, sometimes, again, these uh, surgery requires um, adjunctive procedure. Uh, the left, uh, the kidney is the most common, a nephrectomy for obvious reasons, large masses. Um, here it was left kidney and left uh, colon. Here it was left colon, left kidney, uh, spleen, tail of pancreas. So um, complete resection is critical. Here's an example of the right kidney uh, that had to go. And again, knowledge of the anatomy to know where things ought to be uh, is critical if you're going to you know, tackle things like this. Uh, because structures are going to be pushed around. They're not going to be where you would expect them. So you need to know how to look for them, where to look for them. So the implications of an optimal RPLNV, aside from optimizing individual patient outcomes, has implications in terms of um, guidelines. Um, and urology has been appropriately criticized for not doing enough randomized trials. And as you know, for clinical stage one, there's multiple ways to manage it. Surveillance, one cycle of chemotherapy, or an RPLND. So Peter Albers and the uh, German collaborative uh, group, the Testis uh, Cancer Study Group, did a randomized trial to compare one cycle of BEP to, RP, to a lymph node dissection. Um, and you can see that in that study, uh, one cycle of BEP did better than RPLND. So the conclusion that was that BEP is better than an RPLND. And that had significant implications in terms of guidelines, European guidelines, AUA guidelines, and so forth, having sat on a number of these uh, committees. But if you look at this study carefully, you look at this study, you see that it's a multi-institutional study of 60 centers over 10 years. 19 centers put on one patient. And one center put on 68 patients. You cannot compare, you can export chemotherapy rather easily, particularly one cycle. But anybody who does one of anything really shouldn't be doing it, uh, quite frankly. Um, so, and I, Josh has uh, written a paper on this uh, years ago um, with American uh, centers in terms of uh, volume of RPLNDs by uh, individual surgeons. And he can uh, maybe comment on that after we're done here shortly. Um, so again, you see that um, many centers had minimal experience managing testis cancer and certainly doing the surgery. So that's a problem. And then if you look at the design of this trial, here you have again, randomized trial level, you know, one uh, evidence, one cycle of BEP, there were only two relapses, 174 patients and only two relapses. And then you look at the arm that had the ipsilateral RPLND. So everybody had a modified template. Some were very skimpy templates. And you can see there were 13 relapses, seven in the retroperitoneum and some in the scrotum. So if you exclude surgical failures, it's really four surgical failure, four systemic failures versus two. Um, and nevertheless, this study really killed RPLND in many centers. And it's, uh, it's referenced in all the guidelines. And this is a very, very flawed study, again, you have inadequate surgery, inadequate surgery compared to optimal chemotherapy. What if the chemo arm 
was a 30% dose, you probably would have had many more relapses. So you have optimal, optimal chemotherapy versus suboptimal surgery. So a problem. So it's suboptimal surgery, again, is a problem for individual patients. It's a problem that goes beyond that. Furthermore, if you look at the patients who had surgery and who had positive lymph nodes, those that were N positive, they get two cycles postoperatively. They've been resected and they're getting double the chemotherapy of the unresected patients. So that is nonsensical, quite frankly. So Dr. Motzer and I wrote the editorial you know, we caught a lot of grief for it. This, uh, you can see many, many problems. Nevertheless, um, there's the study and, um, and these are the issues with it. Recently at the AUA, uh, there were several surgical series presented. And again, there are a whole slew of terms uh, used for retroperitoneal uh, occurrences, in-field, out-of-field, extra-template, ipsilateral, contralateral. The bottom line is any relapse within this bilateral template is a surgical failure, period, full stop. Whatever term you want to use, it's a surgical failure. End of story. And this is last two, three slides. This is a patient that we took care of back in 2010, 13 years old. Very complicated uh, case, had re received chemotherapy, very large masses, and he was operated on uh, in a community hospital. And whenever you do reoperative surgery, I teach the fellows to always look at the initial uh, op note so that you know what they've done, what they haven't done, where they've been, and so forth. And you see this note, and it says, we knew from the beginning we would not move, remove all the gross tumor. So if you know from the beginning that you're not going to accomplish uh, a full resection, then you shouldn't do it. You don't, you don't get credit for doubles and triples in this uh, disease. You've got to hit it out of the park every time. Okay? So if you know you're not going to get it, then the thing to do is send it to a place that has a better shot at removing it. And this is a critical uh, thing because Dr. Donahue wrote a classic paper showing that reoperative surgery is an independent variable for a bad outcome, independent of number of chemo regimens, marker status, pathology. Just the mere fact that you have to reoperate is a bad thing. And you can see it. Uh, Jim McKiernan looked at our reoperative series, survival drops. The, key, uh, the treatment burden goes up. It's just bad all the way around, even in the primary setting. And Dr. Donahue wrote in that article that even if you have viable disease in the specimen, cure is most dependent on completeness of surgery. Your best shot is your first shot. And in many of these cases, there was relative lack of RPLND experience and resolve at the time of the initial procedure. And this RPLND experience is critical. Josh, uh, Josh wrote about this several, uh, several years ago, and he can talk about this in more detail, but you can see that many node dissections are done by low volume surgeons. And that's the bar in this disease is set very, very high. Um, if you've got to make the right decisions and execute them optimally, uh, because again, these are 20 and 30 year old patients. Some are teenagers. They've got 50, 60 years to go. And, um, and you've got to be right for a very long time. Prior to that, Will Lawrence, before he came to Memorial, uh, looked at RRC data and the training uh, of residents and 10% of residents uh, never saw um, any, any RPLNDs. If you saw two, if you, if you were involved in two, you were in the 50th percentile. So most programs have very minimal exposure to RPLNDs. 
So again, uh, to summarize, in-depth knowledge uh, of anatomy is critical to any surgery. It helps you in terms of optimal preoperative planning, maximizing your exposure, reducing complications, and optimizing clinical outcomes. Once you've decided to do the node dissection, you have to maximize both the staging and the therapeutic potential, and only bilateral templates accomplish this. Modified templates do not. Modified templates unnecessarily increase the probability of unresected node uh, retroperitoneal metastasis. Nerve sparing techniques, like I showed you earlier, they obviate the need for reduced templates. And patients are best served in high volume centers. I am very fortunate to have uh, worked to work and have worked with a great multidisciplinary team. Tessis Cancer epitomizes the multidisciplinary approach to uh, cancer. And our latest addition is your very own Rich, um, who is the latest of a string of uh, Northwest alumni. Uh, and all, uh, it's very gratifying to see how well they've all done. And pleasure to see old friends. And thank you very much. It's really a privilege uh, to have uh, participated in your in your program.